Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. If we look at the state of rock here from our perch in the 21st century, we have to admit that it is no longer the main musical driver of popular culture. It just isn't. Hip-hop is king. Now, this does not mean that rock is dead, that it doesn't have a place in our lives, that it isn't going to be around for decades to come. But if you are honest, you will have to admit that hip-hop has extended its reach into popular culture with the strength and depth that used to belong to rock. And it's not like rock's appeal has shrank. It's just that other genres have exploded, hip-hop being the genre with the most growth. All right, let's go back to the 1990s, the last decade where rock ruled everything. Alt-rock was the thing. But if we dig through what happened in the 1990s, we can see how hip-hop not only infiltrated alt-rock, but how it was embraced and incorporated and celebrated and co-opted. Regions of the alt-rock universe began to evolve. The beats got bigger. The rhymes got tougher and more complicated. The whole vibe began to change. And it was all pretty good, but not all of it worked out well. What were hip-hop's effects on alt-rock? We're going to continue with that topic on this next episode on the Alternative 90s. This is the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is the second half of Chapter 5 in our look back at how alt-rock evolved in the 1990s. Like I said, the 90s were the last decade where rock was the dominant form of music. It was also the last pre-internet decade, and the last decade without things like iPods, iTunes, and smartphones. Last time, we got as far as about 1993. We covered the contributions of bands like the Beastie Boys and Faith No More, the importance of the rise of metal to this equation, and the collaborations of groups like Aerosmith and Run DMC and Anthrax and Public Enemy. After years of being wary of each other, rockers and rappers found that they had a substantial amount of common ground and shared interests. And thanks to groups like Body Count, Living Color, The Beastie Boys, and Rage Against the Machine, rap and hip-hop was able to reach both more white kids, the rockers, and people of color, those who embraced hip-hop early. Another successful experiment occurred in 1993, when the producers of a movie called Judgment Night came up with the idea of pairing alternative bands with hard rap acts, white rockers and black rappers. Pearl Jam was teamed with Cypress Hill, Faith No More worked with Booyah Tribe, Slayer worked with Ice-T, and Helmet went into the studio with House of Pain. That record tore down a lot of musical walls and breached plenty of genre barriers. The weight of the world riding on my shoulders, cause I'm a soldier, I thought I told you. You're just another victim, you're just another victim, kid. You're just another victim, you're just another victim, kid. You're just another victim. Helmet, together with House of Pain and a big alternative club hit from 1993. That Judgment Night soundtrack appeared just as the alternative revolution of the early 1990s was starting to peak. Other bands managed to straddle the rock-rap divide with great success and finesse. I still find it very hard to explain why some songs, and just songs, not full albums, managed to cross over into the alternative universe and why so many others did not. Now, let me give you an example. House of Pain came out of L.A. in the early 90s, and were swept into the inclusiveness that came during the original Lollapalooza years. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that its core members were white, like the Beastie Boys, and that their record label wanted to push them in the same direction. Whatever the case, they had one massive alt-rock rap crossover in 1992 with their self-titled debut album. I got the skill, come get your bill, cause when I shoot the gift, I shoot the kill. I came to get down, I came to get down, so get out your seat and jump around. There's House of Pain with Jump Around from their 1992 debut album. After they broke up, two members would find more fame on their own. There was Everlast, and then there's DJ Lethal, who ended up with Limp Bizkit. Another group with a massive alt-rock rap crossover hit was Cypress Hill. The same year that House of Pain was jumping around and the Judgment Night soundtrack was released, along came Cypress Hill with a record called Black Sunday. When it arrived in the summer of 1993, it debuted at number one on the charts, the first time any rap group had done that. 
They were on the Judgment Night soundtrack with Pearl Jam. They were at Woodstock 94. And within a couple of years, they were guesting on The Simpsons in the famous Hullabalooza episode, along with Sonic Youth, The Smashing Pumpkins, and uh, Peter Frampton. And this all came as the result of this huge hit. Yes, I'm the pirate pilot of this ship. If I dip with the ultraviolet dream, hide from the red light beam. Now do you believe in the unseen? Look, but don't make the eyes strain. like me is going insane. What are we to make of these crossover songs that entered the realm of alt-rock? Let's try to unpack that. One of the cool things about the people who were into alternative music was that they didn't carry some of the same perceptual baggage that mainstream rock fans had about rap and hip-hop. Chances are, if a person was into Motley Crue and Warrant and Poison and Skid Row and Van Halen and Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones full-time, that person probably wouldn't be too interested in what rap and hip-hop had to offer. On the other hand, alternative fans prided themselves on having an open mind and a willingness to at least try the newest and weirdest music out there. As their numbers grew and as alternative music became more and more popular, more and more people were willing to look at this hybrid of rock and hip-hop and go, cool, bring it on. Even straight rap performers like De La Soul, Cypress Hill, N.W.A. and Ice-T found themselves with more and more white fans. Now, remember that Ice-T blew everyone's mind with his appearance on the 1991 Lollapalooza Festival. He rapped, but he also rocked with his new band Body Count. While all this stuff was going on with punk funk and funk metal and hybrids of punk grunge, metal, and hip-hop in the first half of the 1990s, the Beastie Boys continued to do their thing. If there was ever a band that fell better into that sweet spot between rock and rap, I can't think of one. Their second album, Paul's Boutique from 1989, was initially a commercial disappointment because everybody was expecting another license to ill, you know, more goofy frat boy stuff. Instead, we got a very sophisticatedly constructed record that is now recognized as a masterpiece. We didn't know it then because it was, well, just way too far ahead of its time. But by the time the Beastie Boys got to check your head and ill communication, the world had caught up to them. The Beastie Boys were on the leading edge of a new curve and universally considered to be doing something really, really cool through 1992, 1993, and 1994. Was there ever a better hybrid of rock, alt-rock, punk, rap, and hip-hop than this? As we reach 1995, and thanks to hip-hop, the palette of sounds available to alt-rockers had increased dramatically beyond just grunge, punk, and the various electronic sounds that had brought us this far. And there was more to come. A lot more. Hang on. You're listening to the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. This is the second half of Chapter 5 of our look back at the alt-rock of the 1990s. And this episode is all about the influence of hip-hop on alternative music. Around the same time we were gorging on Beastie Boys, Cypress Hill, and House of Pain, a skinny kid from Los Angeles was putting his own spin on hip-hop influences. After starting out as a weirdo slacker folk singer, touring from coffee house to coffee house on a Greyhound bus, Beck Hansen returned to L.A. and started playing with a newly acquired drum machine. The first experiment turned out okay. That was an obscure song called MTV Makes Me Wanna Smoke Crack, so he decided to give it another shot. With the help of a friend named Carl Stevenson, Beck put together some demos that he planned to release on a small L.A. label called Bongload. Bongload liked it and pressed up a thousand copies, which just kind of sat there, unsold, on the shelves of the local record stores for almost two years. But then the single was discovered by some radio types who decided to give it a little love. And soon everybody was singing and rapping along with this Beck guy, a self-described loser. It's 
not folk. That's not rap. It's not hip hop. It's not rock. It's just Beck. If you were around in 1994 when that song started gaining traction, you'll remember how insanely different and fresh it sounded. Loser only increased the growing tilt towards a new sound that was part rock and part rap. Rap was huge on its own, but more and more of that sound and attitude not only began to reach white ears, but that sound and attitude was adopted by white rock performers. Beck began to sell records by the truckload. Rage Against the Machines albums went multi-platinum. The Beastie Boys and the Chili Peppers continued to sell millions of records. The Lollapalooza Festival helped bring rap to white kids by booking main stage acts like Ice-T, Ice Cube, George Clinton, Cypress Hill, and A Tribe Called Quest. Even the Sisters of Mercy, one of the greatest goth bands of all time, contributed to this spread of hip-hop and rap by agreeing to a co-headlining tour with Public Enemy. Meanwhile, groups like House of Pain and Cypress Hill and Body Count were heard more and more in alternative dance clubs and on new rock radio stations. Fans ate this up, especially the emerging post-Gen Xers, who had zero preconceptions about what rock should sound like. Unlike the generation that ushered in the grunge era of the early 1990s, these early Generation Y kids grew up with rap. They were the first generation to have never known a world without it. All they cared was that the music was loud and full of energy and full of anger. It sounded great on car stereos and on headphones. And they were very, very aware that the music was despised by their parents. And let me say this again, because it cannot be understated. It's 1995. Let's say your dad is 45 and his daughter is 17. Chances are that if dad was cooler in his younger days... He grew up on the Sex Pistols and the Clash and early U2 and David Bowie and the Ramones. If you're his daughter, do you really want to be listening to dad's music? No, you want your own music. And if you can find something that dad doesn't really get or totally hates, that's even better. This is all part of the parent-child dynamic over music that's been repeated every generation for the past hundred years or longer. And there was plenty of music to annoy mom and dad. In addition to straight-up rap, like Tupac and Biggie and Dre and Snoop, there were all the blends and hybrids and variations, some of which crossed over into at least the fringes of the alternative world. We had Jurassic 5, A Tribe Called Quest, Wu-Tang, De La Soul, Dream Warriors. And then there was Trip Hop, a British crossbreeding of hip-hop and electronica, that gave us acts like Portishead, Morchiba, Sneaker Pimps, Estero, and probably the greatest of them all, Massive Attack. Massive Attack and Teardrop from their 1998 album Mezzanine. And yes, that was used as the theme song for the TV show House. You see what I mean about how hip-hop and rap began to slowly infiltrate the mainstream and start driving culture on all levels? Songs like that went down pretty smooth. But at the other end of the spectrum was the hardest, heaviest, and most intense marriage of hip-hop and rock. And this is when we get into what became known as New Metal. That's coming up next. Now, back to the ongoing history of new music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Okay, I'm going to be up front with you as we get into this final segment. It's going to focus on new metal, which was one of the most polarizing forms of alt rock ever conceived. Some of it has aged okay. The rest of it, not so much. The most successful of all the new metal bands is probably Korn, who came out of the California desert in the early 1990s. Led by an apprentice mortician named Jonathan Davis, one of his old jobs was to pick up bodies at traffic accident scenes, Korn took what Rage Against the Machine was doing, added in a healthy dose of grunge, and then mixed in a bunch of Cypress Hill. Now, lyrically, the band was focused on personal tragedy and angst and fear, and then they turned everything up to 11. And over the years, they managed to sell about 35 million records. Korn, 
Horn and their biggest hit, Freak on a Leash, from their 1998 album, Follow the Leader. Another major hip-hop star when the odometer flipped from 1999 to 2000 was Kid Rock. His real name was Bob Ritchie, and he grew up in the Detroit suburb of Romeo, Michigan. Dad was a car dealer, a very successful car dealer, by the way, so don't believe all those stories about Kid Rock coming straight out of a trailer. He grew up in a house with a yard that was five acres and had an apple orchard. He'd been working on a fusion of metal, hip-hop, funk, pop, and country since about 1990, which is when he released his first album. When he first appeared, he was considered pretty weird. Outside of the Beastie Boys, the term white rapper conjured up images of vanilla ice. But those kinds of put-downs didn't stop Kid Rock. He had this vision, a vision he calls very white trash, public enemy style rap, plus the Stooges, plus Kiss, plus Hank Williams. Like I said, he's a big country fan. By 1996, he was getting good reviews for the record he put out on his own Top Dog label. He was even getting props from other rap and rock players. All he needed was a window of opportunity. That moment when rock and rap synced up just so. Then, in August 1998, things did start to come together. MTV started playing tracks from his album Devil Without a Cause. He was picked up by the Warped Tour. And from there, things began to build. A year later, Devil Without a Cause had sold more than 4 million copies. The late 1990s saw signing after signing after signing of new metal bands. Some were easily digestible, and maybe some of them should have never been categorized under the heading of new metal to begin with. I'm thinking of uh, Incubus, Puddle of Mud, Evanescence, Orgy, Papa Roach, Three Days Grace. Most eventually escaped that classification, something that many fought very hard to do, but they were in that bucket at one time. Other bands were much more intense because of their pronounced metal leanings, Disturbed, Mudvayne, Slipknot, System of a Down. And then there were those who took new metal to its extremes and beyond. Bands like Limp Bizkit. Now, you bet I thought I was going to play something for them, didn't you? And I, I know I should, but I, I, I just can't. If there's just one band that came to symbolize the worst of new metal and a group that was the focus of the backlash, it was Limp Bizkit. But let's not forget that for a couple of albums, they were freaking huge. They sold over 40 million albums and could attract 50,000 people to see them at a stadium. But some ill-advised career moves, including an appearance at Woodstock 99 that was marred by violence and destruction, not to mention some below-par albums, they flamed up pretty fast at the end of the 90s. Instead, let's play something from the most successful of all the bands to descend from the new metal era. No other band ever created a better and more cohesive hybrid of alternative rock and rap than these guys. And in the process, they sold over a hundred million records. So yeah, something good did come out of new metal. Lincoln Park. Now, to be very fair, that song came out in 2000 and not in the 90s, but Linkin Park would not have existed or sold 100 million records had they not been born in the new metal era of the late 90s. And to think that their demos were turned down by record labels almost 50 times before they were signed at the end of 1999. That's how much the industry believed that new metal was over. Now, today, alt-rock and hip-hop mix freely all the time. Artists that mix rock and rap are all around us. It's so common that we often don't even notice that we're listening to a hybrid of styles that didn't exist until the late 80s and one that was considered radical and weird until we got into the 90s. Like I said at the beginning, hip-hop and rap allowed alt-rock to stretch even further and to make the tent for fans even bigger. That will go down as one of the most important musical evolutions of the 90s. Back with more in a moment. More of the ongoing history of new music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. A couple of episodes back, we talked about a revival, how Britpop resurrected some of the great British sounds of the 60s and early 70s and then repackaged them for kids of the 1990s. 
Next time, we'll look at another revival, something that popped up just as grunge started to wheeze. It's the mid-90s punk revival, an avalanche of music that included a renewed interest in everything from hardcore to ska punk. That'll be part six of our history of the alt-rock of the 1990s. Until then, we can meet up at my website, which is a journal of musical I update it every day. I issue a free newsletter every day, too. Just sign up and you'll have some cool music news and information in your inbox by 10 a.m. Eastern. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Google+. And don't forget that we make ongoing history shows available for downloads as podcasts. You can get them for free at iTunes or wherever you get your on-demand audio. The 90s Punk Revival, next time with the ongoing history of new music. Technical production is by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast at iTunes and through Google Play. 